and boom. With this technique and technology, the kids' test scores will go through the roof. But how do I know it'll work for my students? We know it will work for your students. We have data that shows it works. And other schools are doing it too. I saw the data, but... Mm. Look, just do it. Your district has already bought the program. But the program doesn't teach the subject. It teaches the test. The content? Teach the content? Is that what you are worried about? Yes. I thought this was a strategy to help my students grasp content better. The details. I get it. But the focus should be on achievement, which is the test, right? Thank you for the presentation. And the bread. I'm not confident this will work. How much did we spend on this? There are many strategies, practices, and techniques being offered by experts to improve education. Some are worthwhile, and others just trendy. But how do we know which ones are effective? For the classroom teacher, especially new teachers, determining best practices can be tricky. But one thing to keep in mind, no one knows your students like you do. And in order to find the practices that work best for them, we have to become the experts. Most of us have spent time and effort in honing our craft only to be told how to instruct our students by outsiders. Help is not bad, but often it feels more like a hindrance. We can see from the jump how certain strategies might be problematic, but we don't always have an alternative to suggest. We can't simply discount new initiatives we believe won't work if we're not prepared to do the work needed to find something more fitting for our specific students. This series, The Teacher as an Expert, is all about laying the groundwork for articulating your expertise as an educator. We start with understanding the difference between research-based and evidence-based practices. Take a look. So looking at research versus evidence-based practices, we want to clarify terminology, we want to examine a comparison, discuss best practices, and highlight some keys to remember. There are three major types of research when it comes to best practices. Scientific, which in short, are practices that have theoretical and scientifically sound um, foundations, but haven't been tested. Then you have research-based and then evidence-based. Research-based are practices that have concepts supported by science or theory, but they have not been tested in a controlled, unbiased setting and thus not proven as effective. Meaning, the theory makes sense, the researcher tested it, but they didn't test it in comparison to another practice, and no one other than the researcher has tested the practice out. Evidence-based, however, are practices that have practices that have replicable steps for implementation. So anyone can look at the research on the evidence-based practice and duplicate that research in, the, in a, another environment. The steps are clear. The practice has been tested comparatively, meaning the theoretical practice that is being, has been researched has been compared to a traditional practice or another practice and has been shown more effective and it's been tested unbiasedly. So someone other than the researcher or the foundation that's supporting the research has tested this model. All they have to gain is the student achievement. They don't, they don't get any recognition for it. So it's been tested unbiasedly by people who don't have anything to gain by testing out this new practice. So looking at a comparison, with the Every Student Succeeds Act, Title I funding no longer supports research-based practices, meaning Title I funding can't be used for training, implementation, or purchases, purchases of practices that are not evidence-based. Both are theoretically sound. However, research-based has minimal testing, where evidence-based has been tested in various settings. Also, evidence-based 
has been tested in comparison to similar practices, thus showing its proven effectiveness. Where research-based has limited proven effectiveness. So in general about best practices, whether it's research or evidence-based, each practice will have to be, number one, reviewed thoroughly before implementation. You want to do as much research as possible so you have as much information as possible about the process and the practice. It needs to be rationalized for use in lieu of other practices. As a practitioner and now expert, you want to be able to give the rationale for why you're implementing this this alternative practice in lieu of maybe the district's prescribed practice for, let's say, reading comprehension. Why are you choosing to implement this other new practice? In addition, you'll need to adjust the practice to fit the needs of the intended population. It is very unlikely you'll be able to simply look at a research practice or evidence-based practice and just implement it. Certain changes are gonna be needed in order to meet the needs of your population. And no matter which one you choose, they need to be monitored for effectiveness within the intended population. You have to be able to show that they work. So some keys to remember. Only evidence-based practices can be financed by Title I funding. However, both research and evidence-based practices can be utilized in the classroom setting. Why? Because you're not using any funding to implement these practices. All you're doing is testing out new ways of improving your craft and helping the students. Also, administrative permission may be required for implementation. The thing about the administrative permission is you probably just want to do it by default and that makes the previous slide imperative. You want to be able to explain to them exactly what you're doing, why you're doing it, and how you're going to do it. And that way you're establishing yourself not only as a practitioner expert but also as a concerned practitioner for trying to increase your skills and the student's achievement subsequently. And that is research and evidence-based practices in a nutshell. Hopefully that clarified things. If not, there are links to additional resources below. Best practices are about understanding the data behind them. This helps you, the educational expert, make sounder decisions during selection and planning. Our next video is about finding the practices we want to implement. This process is not easy, but being an expert requires a little sweat. Please feel free to leave your comments and questions below, and don't forget to join the discussion. See you next time.